we had, I think, like a meta panel discussion because we were trying to figure out what to call this panel uh, for about, I don't know, like 10 cycles of email. And uh, uh, I think we drove each other uh, crazy. But it was, um, it's interesting because this is such a fraught issue in many ways. And I'm a venture capitalist who invests in tech companies. Uh, my, my firm's called Flying Fish Partners. So, uh, you know, kind of even walking into this issue is always one that, that makes me um, super interested and stimulated and, and also sort of gets my hackles up at the same time, which, which uh, I felt uh, some of the time when we were talking about the, the title of the panel. And I'm, I'm actually on a panel later today um, that is all people in tech um, talking about the future of technology and trying to kind of project out. So I'm hoping to get some nuggets um, from my panelists here that I can, you know, throw grenades in the birdbath uh, later this afternoon when we're talking about, you know, how we're going to hack humanity and all of that. Um, so great to see you all. I'm going to just briefly introduce our panelists and then we'll jump right in. And we'd like to make this interactive. So I've got just a couple of questions for each panelist, which we will probably deviate from, and, um, and then I would encourage you that if you have a thought or a question as we're having a dialogue, just raise your hand and we'll interject you into the conversation uh, so that we can keep it lively and, and interesting. Uh, so first of all, uh, we've got Shankar Narayan, is that right? Narayan. Narayan, okay, close enough. Uh, not really, but all right. And he is the Technology and Liberty Project Director at the ACLU of Washington. And I should tell you that I went to law school with your boss. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yes, I'm, I, I'm familiar with the mission and, and very close to it. Uh, we also have Steve Schwartz, uh, Director of Public Affairs for Tableau Software and for the Tableau Foundation. And Amy Tao, is that right? All right. Um, civic Designer for the City of Seattle. So I think I'll start out with uh, Shankar. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll move around with some different questions. Um, shuffle here. So Shankar, in my world, uh, we look for companies that have identified a problem or need that can be solved 10 times better and 10 times cheaper with the application of technology. How do you see that, double-sided page, playing out when the problem is a community problem or need rather than a commercial problem? Uh, thanks, Senator. I think that's, <clears throat> that's a good question, and I'm going to uh, try to answer it by perhaps deconstructing, uh, you know, the question itself, uh, starting with the question of problem or need, right? The, the, the question arises, right, whose problem or need? Uh, does it impact differentially across different communities? Who made the decision as to what the problem or need was and who was actually in the room, right, when, when that decision was made? Uh, then, of course, there's the question of what is better, right? Uh, better for whom is the question I would ask back. Uh, better by what metric or what measure, right? Uh, you know, thinking about how we look at the way technology is built, right? This connects to a, a couple of really big narratives out in the world. I think one is uh, this narrative of innovation and uh, you know, technology sort of being this neutral thing that's going to come in, right, and fix all that's wrong with our broken brick and mortar systems, which, by the way, are indisputably broken, right? We have done a terrible job in addressing inequity in our society. I mean, just look around, right? And, uh, uh, you know, in some ways, in trying to answer these questions, we're actually building two airplanes, not just one, as we're flying them, right? We are... Uh, trying to figure out how inequity impacts, and we haven't done a great job, right, in, in fixing that in our society, which means uh, we have to figure out how that makes its way into technology, which, as you heard this morning, you know, uh, layers onto these, these layers of uh, uh, biased data, uh, who gets to frame the question, uh, and how it impacts out in the world. Uh, and, and then figure out, right, the layer of how that applies to technology. So I would say, you know, the place to start really is to engage communities that are impacted by uh, the, the differential impacts of technology. Uh, not assume, right, that technology impacts equally for everyone because, of course, it never has, right? We have a long history of technologies differentially impacting people uh, and it happens that those are the same people that are usually on the wrong end of structural inequity, right? A 
an example uh, that I'll give you, right, and, and we'll return to this one, but uh, risk analysis, uh, 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 predictive risk assessments in the criminal justice system, all right? It turns out that uh, because our data is incredibly, uh, is, is based on decades of a, an inequitable criminal justice system, it's extremely difficult to build a tool that doesn't reflect and in fact amplify those biases, right? Even before you get to the question of risk assessments, there's the question of why is this the right question, right? It's a very different thing to assess the risk of someone sitting in front of a judge than it is to use data to actually determine what interventions would help that person not recidivate. Totally different conversation, right? Uh, and yet, unfortunately, because uh, 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 you know, we, we have a lot of money and court systems running towards uh, the risk assessment question, uh, the entire brick and mortar discussion has been dragged away from where we were getting to, which was an interventions and outcomes based model. So that's one example of how much it matters to get the right people in the room at the very beginning from the impacted communities, not deciding the problem for them, but creating mechanisms for them to, to define the problem and also what the solution might be. And I have a lot of ideas on that, but I'll save them. Yeah, sort of curious, because um, I, I, I feel, and this is a follow-up question to that, I feel like we spend a lot of time in sort of the progressive community um, kind of critiquing innovation and, and kind of saying, well, you're doing it wrong. But I, I don't feel, uh, or I don't have a strong sense of um, kind of a progressive technology community, and I, I keep hoping for it to uh, arise, and maybe it'll arise out of this room, but a progressive technology community that is saying things like, we love technology and we see really hard problems that we can solve that are pro-social and we want to apply technology to do that. So you, you, the example you gave at the end there of how do we take broken brick and mortar around um, interventionist and, um, and you know, diversionary sort of, you know, get people educated instead of uh, dealing with them on the other end of the, of the spectrum after they've fallen through the cracks. Um, I don't see enough technology and, and sort of business models evolving there. Are you, are, and your job is sort of uniquely kind of watchdoggy, but do you feel like there's a, a way for you to be a builder as opposed to a defender? Absolutely. I mean, I think I want to say I love technology, and uh, it is a false dichotomy to say that, you know, innovation and uh, social good from technology, are, you know, can't, cannot coexist. They can, but it is also indisputably true that we are not doing a particularly good job of getting there, right? So, uh, you know, I, I often get asked, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And I say, I'm really neither one. I, I would reframe to say, look, there is a lot of evidence around, uh, you know, for example, uh, bias in AI systems, right? Uh, and what I see in the real world is very rarely does that bias actually prevent a technology from being used, right? Uh, now, you know, you could call that optimism or pessimism. I call it evidence-based, right? Not only evidence around our current set of technologies, but a long history of differential impacts of technology, right? Impacting different groups differently, depending on where they are in, 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 in uh, our system, which is indisputably structurally inequitable. So yes, you know, I think we should build those mechanisms. And I think it really starts with uh, uh, you know, reversing some of the assumptions that we have in, in, in the processes where we build technology. These are ultimately questions of power, right? And I see a lot of tech companies that have wholeheartedly adopted the language of fairness, right? The language of equity. Uh, but when the rubber really hits the road, these are also money-making entities, right? So I just came out of a bruising legislative fight where you know two of our backyard corporations right here in Seattle, uh, you know, were pushing a bill that, for example, allowed uh, pervasive and widespread use of face surveillance. You know, a technology that that has dem demonstrated biases and layers onto uh, a long history of biased police practices. Uh, and these companies, I was in meetings with their leadership where community leaders came in and said, look, here's how surveillance technology has impacted us across a long time frame where the safeguards actually didn't work to keep us safe. 
uh, these companies still went in, right, despite saying we want strong regulations, uh, where the rubber met the road, that was not translated into action. So we need better mechanisms, and I think there's a role for company self-policing, right, where companies like Microsoft, for example, the same company that supported, uh, you know, one of these bills, uh, would create ethical committees, right, like Microsoft's Ether Committee. There's a role for that, but at the end of the day, policymakers also need to step in, create transparency frameworks and substantive applications, right, where we get to say sometimes that a technology is not appropriate for use. Uh, and then there's the courts, right, where, you know, I'm also a litigator, and so, uh, you know, I don't like to rely on them because they, they, you know, they are not necessarily the most uh, technologically advanced uh, entities, but, but, you know, we can backstop as well to apply some of our constitutional uh, frameworks to to that uh, to that space, and we need to do those things uh, so that tech is actually implemented with our values and not not the other way around. We'll have to have an offline discussion about that privacy legislation because I'm on the other side of that from you, and so would love to try to figure out how we resurrect that and do something that makes sense for everybody. Um, Amy, you get the mic. Good so uh, this, I think, follows on pretty logically from that discussion, because your job is to build things as opposed to um, uh, watchdog against things. Um, so your job is civic designer for the city of Seattle. Uh, explain that job so my mom can understand it. And what's an example of how the city has used data to both improve outcomes for the people it serves and, again, with my capitalist hat on, um, save money at the same time? Who would like to be Heather's mom? <laughs> How about you? Okay. Um, hello. I'm Amy. I work for the city of Seattle, the mayor's hey, office. Hello. Nice to, nice to meet you. Do you ever feel sometimes <clears throat> government services don't really work the way you would like them to? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, my job is to really try to make that a little better for you. So my job is to make public services more people-centered. And that means that uh, when somebody like me or my colleagues at the city, we have a brilliant idea to fix something for your life, uh, we go out and talk with you first. So not only do we go out and talk with you, we try to bring you into the process. So when we're ready to design a solution for you, um, we want to hear from you. So let's say you want healthy food for your family. Uh, maybe we would go and see how you're currently getting food for your family now bring you in later and say, this is what we heard from you and people like you. Um, what are your, some of your ideas to address it? So that's part of what I do. So Heather's mom. <laughs> it's pretty fun. So give us an example of something that you've done recently and how that has, or not recently, just mm -hmm. one of your favorite ones, that how that's uh, helped uh, the folks who live here in Seattle and, and maybe uh, caused us to have a little bit more resources to do some of the other things we need to do from a tax-based perspective. Sure. I want to preface that with, so the city has about 11 to 12,000 employees, depending on the time of year, and I'm one of our only designers. And we have a few that are working just on Seattle.gov, but when it comes to actually using design processes or human-centered design to build services, I'm one of the only ones. So it's a small discipline. It needs all of you, and so um, preface that. But I'll... I'll uh, talk about an example that is related to Steve, actually. So, um, <laughs> kind of. Um, so last year, uh, the mayor's, well, when the mayor first came to office, she had an executive order trying to help folks um, to stay in Seattle. So it's about affordability. And one of her policy advisors thought uh, a brilliant idea would be to make an affordability portal, which is a website that has all of our services that um, if you're income qualified, you would lower your cost of living. So that sounds like a great idea. Uh, the mayor asked my team to take a look at that. And the first thing we saw was they already had a tech technology solution defined already. They said, solve this problem with a portal. So we were kind of stuck a little bit, but my team went out, we did research, we talked to low-income residents, we talked to community-based organizations, service providers, to kind of find out how do they access services now and what their experiences are. So, of course, we found out nobody goes to seattle.gov to look for services, <laughs> obviously. Um, and generally, benefit seekers, they'll, they'll learn through their friends, families, um, places they already connect to, like the library. And a lot of these folks will not go online to apply for something. Um, and so, really, our takeaway from that is this 
solution, if it existed, would benefit people um, who already access technology or perhaps service providers that serve them. So we know that, but we still needed to build a technology solution. So we went about a process, we prototyped, we tested, we came up with as good of a technology solution as we could, and now we are partnering with um, the Mayor's Innovation Advisory Council, which include people like Steve, and um, I'm working with a really great team at Expedia. Um, they have volunteer employees that are helping us build it, and then we'll go out and test with the community again. So. It's very cool. Yes, I'm also part of this group. You've got mm -hmm. the sort of the IAC uh, yeah. Innovation Advisory Council group here in, in force on the, uh, on the panel. It really has been a great experience so far. Oh, yes, please. Hi, I'm Steve. We haven't done intros yet. Um, uh, big part of the reason was everything needed to be designed in partnership with Seattle IT. And it needed to be done in a way that wa didn't add any additional costs for the city. So it had to be built on existing infrastructure. So for all of the participating companies, it really is a function of um, what Seattle IT could onboard directly without, in without any additional budget allocation this year. I'd like to tell you it's more exotic answer than that, but that's pretty much it. Baby steps. So Steve, now that I got you now with I'm the mic here, here uh, I think uh, I have another question for you, but this would probably be a good segue into my second question. So um, Tableau, I think uh, among the, the companies here in the city, um, particularly in, in its sort of size category, has gone um, deeper than a lot of others in terms of your civic involvement in, in a lot of different ways, you know, micro and macro. And you brought tech to the table in uh, getting involved in that, in that civic uh, sphere. Uh, what can you tell us about that experience as a hardcore tech company? Yeah, um, quick show of hands, who has used Tableau? Okay, so for everybody with your hands down, what are you waiting for? <laughs> um, we are a comp company with a really simple mission. We help people see and understand their data. It's not anything more exotic than that, really just there is the volume of data floating around in our world is only increasing, and obviously it comes with a huge amount of uh, conversations about who is ingesting that data and for what end. But really, ultimately, we make the software that, that can power the analytics um, that can help individuals up to massive organizations make sense of the data, share it, communicate, tell, tell stories with it, and help people find insights in it. So uh, for longer time Seattle residents, you probably heard the, Seattle, the Tableau name, but there was absolutely no fingerprint of Tableau on anything involved with civic life. Um, company came up here in 2004, went public in 2013, and it really wasn't until 2016 that we even started dipping our toes in the water. And we had, had uh, created the Tableau Foundation when we went public in, in 13 and staffed it up in 2014. And that was almost the, f the first opportunity where the company thought outside of short-term sales for how it can engage in the larger world. And we spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, we are never going to outspend Microsoft. Um, we are never going to have the, the direct sort of political sway of a company like Amazon, but how can we get directly involved in a way that is meaningful and valuable in our community? And what we really saw was an opportunity to use the two best resources we have, our product and our people, to go try things that might help, but haven't been tried before. And it's hard, you know, as Amy was talking about, getting projects off the, the ground, resourcing projects as they're getting off the ground, if we can come in and be an ally, if we can come in and make the product available, if we can make the people who build the product available to work with partners, we can uh, hopefully develop new models for solving old problems, things that, we've, we, that have been a challenge for whether you know, here, cities, communities, nationally, globally, um, you know, that's, our, that's what we can do well. And so being a reasonably small company, by comparison to some of our neighbors, um, we're actually able to go in and, and be a partner in problem solving. And that's really been what's driven a lot of Tableau's engagement model. Um, here in Seattle, the IAC, I think the timing, uh, as we were 
coming to terms with the fact that this is our role, the IAC was a really interesting opportunity to add to that. Um, you know, to have a direct conversation with folks at the city about not just where they think, where they've got data and they think Tableau could help, but also start to have conversations about things that they may not be thinking of as a data problem or a data challenge and go in and, and see if we can help figure some of this out. So it's stuff like what Amy is talking about and citizen empowerment. Uh, a lot of it is actually transparency and disclosure. You know, how can we reduce a lot of the uh, reporting burden for uh, different departments within the city so that citizens can have better information, better access to what's going on inside their government. And then there is just a ton of operational uses of data inside the city where, I mean, I, you said it yourself, that it doesn't always feel like the most efficiently operated organization. Um, and a lot of the times it's because there are services being delivered with technology solutions that are 15, 20 years old, haven't been supported, or <laughs> in uh, more than one case, where you have entire departments run off of a couple of Excel sheets. And you know, you think about this city in 2019, that's almost unconscionable. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> I think I saw a question here. Yeah, I was just curious, I'm sorry if I missed this in someone's question, but what is the IAC? Sorry. So Mayor Durkin, uh, via executive order, established the Innovation Advisory Council. So it is a uh, group of technology companies that are available to work with the executive branch and, and all of the department heads. Um, the mandate, it's uh, not specific to particular projects, but focusing on issues of homelessness and affordability and then mobility. Um, and actually, interestingly, in this process, disaster response has come, or disaster preparedness has come up as a third focus area. But really, it's a collection of technology companies that are, have raised their hand and said, yeah, we're happy to help, talk to us. You know, we, we wanna be good neighbors, we wanna be good citizens. And so it's the co-chairs, uh, Tableau and Expedia, um, Technology Access Foundation uh, over in West Seattle, White Center, and then um, Artifact our host today, or the, the fourth co-chairing organization. Uh, yeah, just a little gloss on that, and then I'll take a couple more questions. So it, it's also been a really interesting thing from a political standpoint, because it's a, you know, sort of a, a, a way to get some sectors that have not communicated well in the past and get them working together and open those lines of communication. In the back? Uh, yeah, so actually Amy's project, uh, the affordability portal when it initially started, and we're stitching together uh, affordability programs, so subsidies and other supports that are available currently in, is it 29 different agencies? It's a lot. It's a lot. All of them have their different requirements, application processes, um, and, and there's no real central repository. So if you think about that project, there is the citizen focus side of it, where how can you stitch together so people have a one-stop shop to figure out what they qualify for, can apply, all this. The other thing we've learned in this process is most of those programs are wildly underutilized. So when you're having conversations in the community about, um, you know, there are massive affordability challenges in a city that's grown this fast and seen this kind of accelerated wealth, uh, acceleration of wealth. So can we also report on the systemic uh, utilization of these programs and so there is the service piece of it but using the same data also you know for, if you are a reporter who wants to cover you know, the affordability issue um, rather than having to contact each of those 29 agencies having a single dashboard that shows utilization rates it frees city staff up from having to respond to that request and and also raises the visibility of those programs in the process and there's a variety of versions of that. The homeless services, um, you have a, a similar situation where you're reporting to the council once a quarter. If we could get the, that performance data up to real time, it's another opportunity. I think this would be, yeah, I was gonna just bring Shankar into this conversation. Uh, go ahead, and then I might have a question for you. Well, actually, I have a question for the other folks on the panel, since <laughs> I think I'm the, I'm the only one perhaps not involved with the Innovation Advisory Council, which I was Why not? Uh, well, I can tell you why not. I mean, I think, uh, you know, for, from our perspective, right, uh, the ACLU's been working on homelessness issues for quite a long time, and I can, you know, I can say 
for many years we worked with a coalition of ho you know organizations that work with homeless people, homeless advocates, and the challenge we were trying to push back on was the problem of homeless sweeps, right? This practice that has been the practice in the city for a long time of sweeping people, you know, taking away their tents and their belongings, uh, and making it very difficult for them to survive on the streets, right? And and in fact disrupting further people's very fragile lives where they then essentially reestablish themselves on a different street corner with even fewer resources because of course uh, the, the commensurate resources have not been put in to, to addressing the root cause of homelessness. Um, so you know, for, for me as well, my, my question is uh, how the, you know, and, and again, I don't know a lot about how <clears throat> the Innovation Advisory Council has worked with these groups that, that, that do the work, right? Going back to this question of who, uh, who frames the question and who frames what the problem is. I will say the sweeps have been, there was, you know, the, the subject of litigation on our part and actually probably further litigation and they, they have continued. But, uh, you know, the, the thing that sprang to mind for me was this division, right, into supposed builders and breakers, right? This idea that you know, if we're demanding a better deal, right, if we want fairness and inclusivity in the way the processes work, then we are the speed bump, right? But I would say, again, if I had it to build, right, I would put those same groups that we worked with, which I think are incredibly knowledgeable about the root causes of the problem of homelessness on the Innovation Advisory Council with the tech companies that are already there so they could work together you know, as, you know, I don't call them builders, don't call them breakers, right? They're solving a problem, right? And that, to me, is a, a better way to, to do innovation. So I know, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, sort of elevation of, of the status of, of uh, you know, the, the Innovation Advisory Council. For my money, you know, we have another process around the Seattle Surveillance Ordinance and the community groups that are working on a working group to inform the city's rollout of surveillance technologies, right, with, with safeguards, uh, that to me looks a little bit more like, uh, you know, what you would want, which is impacted communities coming to the table, informing the decision makers, having a public discussion, right, that's, that's, that's not behind closed doors, that, that will really allow the decision makers to create a values framework in which a technology can be rolled out. And it's okay to disagree, by the way. I, I know, <laughs> right, like we, it, it, you know, it, it's okay for us to be having this discussion. I think it's healthy, right? And and I, I do think that, uh, you know, the, the, the word innovation is often the source of some of these, these, these conflicts, right? Because, yeah. you know, if I was a Luddite that hated technology, I probably wouldn't have become a technology lawyer in this town 18 years ago, right? Like that's when I started practicing, I was up the street. I worked for Microsoft, I worked for Amazon, I worked for a lot of these tech companies. So I just want a better deal and I want the mechanisms that will allow the impacted communities uh, to, to that, that really understand the problems uh, to be at the table when the decisions about them are being made. Yeah. yeah, I think we can all agree with that and I certainly do. And I think one um, thing that we are really conscious of is when the technology companies came to the table, the departments especially if you're talking about homelessness, uh, departments like the Human Services Department that contract with a lot of people working in shelters, things like that, they are at the table. And the, at the beginning of the council, I think there was some, um, the technology companies, there's ways of working that can benefit the city. There's, of course, the technology, it's, it's much more advanced in the city, but the city has a lot of uh, both the knowledge about these issues and the responsibility to serve everybody. So we're not profit driven. So we, uh, the city, we, we do have an initiative called the Race and Social Justice Initiative, which rolled out with, I think, Mayor's, Mayor Nichols. And a lot of us at the city, we really uh, care about that and we try to lead with racial equity. So I know in my work, there's a thing called equity-centered design, so, which is kind of an augmentation of human-centered design which really tries to center the work on the communities that are most impacted. So design has an inclusion and diversity problem. So we as designers, we have this privilege to design these systems that might cause more inequities. So we have to think about our process and the responsibility we have as designers. Um, but that hopefully speaks to a little bit about, I don't think we are in disagreement at all. 
Yeah, it seems like, a, a, you know, coming back to the theme of this conference, of course, the sort of the designing the process that leads to the product is sort of the key that I'm hearing, you know, from, from everyone here on the, uh, on the panel. Um, it's, it's interesting because one of the frustrations in the business community, which I can speak to a little bit, is, is that when we think about an issue like um, homelessness, we think about who is the customer and what we want is the customer to dictate the solution like we would do in a uh, for-profit product. You know, when I'm selling, uh, um, you know, a new uh, SaaS service, I, I'm deeply interested in like, what will the customer pay for? And one of the frustrations with homelessness in the business community has been obviously what we're selling as service providers in the, in the, um, in the sector trying to serve people who are experiencing homelessness, they don't want to buy, right? You know, the shelters are not working because they're not the right thing for whatever reason. And so it's, it's been a really interesting, um, uh, it's been a very interesting current to see sort of the business community agreeing with this idea of find out what the customer wants and then design it around that um, because we know that what's happening now is not working. So I saw some more hands up. I think you might have been the first one, Lucas. Go ahead. Um, this is kind of information that's had low and hearing yeah. that you know, after you go public, you come in and, and build this foundation and you your work. I think a lot of times it's often too late. Like companies keep creating their business models and their incentives, and then by the time they're <coughs> large enough, like, okay, now we can come help. So how, as maybe a venture capitalist and other companies, how can you build yeah. new incentives to participate while you're building your company, while you're Entirely fair question. So, uh, history of the Tableau Foundation. The plans were actually in place almost from the very beginning. Um, we needed to go public to capitalize the foundation. So it was a pre-IPO stock gift from the founders uh, that was put into a donor advised fund at the Seattle Foundation so that the day the company went public, it capitalized the, the endowment. So. It is not something that was sort of uh, anybody looking to sort of absolve themselves from past sins as much as it was, you know, when you're on that on-ramp, um, there's not a bunch of extra resources to be able to do. Now, we did have a nonprofit sales unit, and this is one of my soapboxes. Anybody is welcome to knock me off at any time. We <laughs> the inherent assumption that nonprofit and impact are interchangeable um, you know, say what you will, but you know, the Canadian Jiu-Jitsu Association and the American Cancer Society both fall on, and the NFL fall under those, that, that classification. Um, but it really wasn't until we had the extra resources in place with the endowment um, and the ability to start granting out software um, to, and support that we were able to really bring the foundation to more of a living program. Um, and on that latter point, there were a lot of really difficult discussions about where, where does nonprofit sales end and where does grant making begin? Again, that question of just because you're a C3, do you automatically qualify or is there some sort of unique chemistry you're looking for? And that's really where we took the approach of if you had a zero to one risk spectrum, you know, one being, oh, you want to use non you want to use Tableau in your accounting department for the thing anybody can use it for, Here's our sales team. You want to go out and try to eliminate malaria in Zambia on a promising but entirely unproven model? Uh, yeah, that's the thing we're going we're gonna to spend our grant making time and resources on. So that conversation also needed to happen at a slightly more mature company um, that, that took a little time to get to. Just a quick comment as a VC, um, you know, especially somebody that invests mostly regionally and tries to create new jobs kind of out of this economy. Um, for us, the more involved our employees are in the community, the more likely they will be to stay here. So that sort of stickiness factor. Um, Steve and I are both involved in another organization called Sea City, which is all about getting um, sort of employees of any tech or tech affiliated company engaged in the community and that's that's a good and you can do that when you're not profitable uh, it's very hard to get your investors like me to say oh yeah you're not profitable go ahead and you know set aside 
at 10% of your non-profitable dollars um, to invest in the community, but we would be really interested in how can we all work in the community as, as people. Yeah, I mean, we do have, so Tableau Public, it, think of it as YouTube for data. You can build uh, dashboards off your own data set. Um, there's a free available version of the product. It has full functionality, everything but a save button. Um, and the only way to preserve that work is up on the platform. So you're entirely right. It can be used. There's no veracity on the data. We've done a bunch of things over the last few years. There's, we have put a terms of service in place, or there's always been a terms of service in place around Tableau Public um, that does, if there is you know, just <laughs> demonstrably false things that add liability to you or me, uh, we will take them down. Um, there is also a lot of, you know, we have a global team of I think 10 working on it, uh, on Tableau Public and keeping an eye on what's going in, what's being seen and how. And I mean, there's, there's some things in there that I think a lot of us find personally objectionable. Um, but we don't necessarily have legally the grounds to take them down. We do have, a, we've added features around attribution and we've added comments and all sorts of ability for the community to police around itself. Now, this does not answer your question. Um, you know, do we have an ombudsman in place? No. Um, should we think about it? Do we think about it? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, there is a, you know, Again, YouTube as sort of a useful model. Um, there's a lot of stuff up on there that you just can't necessarily police or is really unpleasant. Um, we sort of use, we, we try to be as positive as we can about it and use the good content that's up there, continue to promote it, and just try to, I guess, blot out the sun a little bit on the, on the negative. Somebody should also ask me, uh, about Shankar's question about homelessness and voices and I identification. We've got a lot of good content on that one. What do you think about what he said? <laughs> it's great. Um, so you're absolutely right. And actually one of the things uh, we did before we got involved with homelessness in Seattle was get involved with homelessness organizations nationally. Um, started to really get out and figure out what works, what is best practice. And actually what we found was um, data is a really, really critical piece of making those systems work. We've been working with a couple of groups. One is called Community Technology Alliance down out of San Jose. Another is Community Solutions, sort of nominally out of New York, but works nationally. Um, the latter has actually brought chronic and veteran homelessness to functional zero in uh, 13 communities across the country. They're working in another 74, and these are comparable places like Denver and Arlington, Virginia, DC and Jacksonville. Um, cities our size that are dealing with similar homelessness problems, but they have been able to optimize their, the, the actual services system much more effectively. And the way they were able to do that was it gets exactly to your point about hearing from the affected communities. Well, you know, when we talk about who is homeless, there is no one flavor of homelessness. You really have to get into the disaggregated data of there's sort of chronic homelessness. You have, you know, uh, kids coming out of the foster care system at 18 or 21, depending on the state, who don't have the supports they need. Where these cities have been effective, it's not that there is any one program that's the silver bullet. It's actually that you have this huge span of different services available. And having real-time access to data allows at an individual level to tailor what somebody needs to the services that are available immediately. And then systemically, you can start to optimize what is available in your city or your county to, to meet what are the prevailing trends. So it, you, you stop using vocabulary or statistics like we have 30,000 homeless people in Seattle. And instead, you start saying, you know, we have 2,800 chronically homeless people who are the ones you find in these camps. Okay. 
what do we what can we do beyond just a sweep where can we actually get in get services get people whether it's mental health whether it's recovery whether it's jobs whether it's housing subsidy get them on the track and and really treat them like an individual uh through this process i, I think the best analogy is whole patient care and health care um really looking at all of the circumstances of the individual you know, data is a big piece of that. And being able to, you know, here in King County, we have 300 service providers. We need, and none of them are talking to each other, even though many of them are individually best in class nationally for what their individual intervention is. So as much as we can create that culture of collaboration, have by name lists where you, an individual gets treated, uh, the interventions are matched for their needs and then systemically optimize for where we need to be spending our money. We can get a hell of a lot farther than where we are today. I'd love to uh, ask uh, Shankar to comment on that a little bit, just because this is obviously one of those places where uh, government gets really efficient. And right now, we'd love for that to happen. But then they also know everything about us, right? And maybe that sounds good when we're talking about a person who really needs a ton of help. But let's talk a little bit about what you think about when you hear us uh, getting hyper-efficient about helping people. No, I mean, I think that <clears throat> that, that sort of uh, use of technology, right, in a, a, an outcomes-based, right, <clears throat> uh, data-driven way is great, right? What we don't have around that is actually the, the frameworks to ensure that uh, the data, right, is not misused or repurposed, and we've been uh, you know, again, going back to the state legislative debate, we just had this massive debate about what, where those lines should be drawn, right? And how to give individuals meaningful control of their data. Uh, you know, Seattle had an open data report a few years ago that gave the city, I would, I, you know, others may characterize it differently. I would say it gave them middling marks, right? Better than a lot of places and not as good as, as some other places. Uh, you know, I think Seattle IT has also gone through its ups and downs, and so there, you know, there's a little bit of lack of continuity in terms of what the city ought to be doing to protect data. But I think at least that consciousness is there, um, and we should, you know, we, we should build on that so that uh, data can be used in the specific ways uh, 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 that allow it to uh, uh, positively impact people's lives. I do think, uh, you know, one of the challenges in this instance is also, uh, you know, how do you account for the agency of the individual, right, and uh, ensure that they are actually getting some say in, in the trajectory that they're being offered by the city. Um, so, you know, I think that's where uh, uh, the, the companies sort of run out of runway and we do need policymakers to step in, right, to figure out uh, uh, what that framework should look like. I think, you know, we've, unfortunately, we also have a governance and equity and tech committee that uh, hasn't taken a lot of steps in that direction over the last couple of years. Uh, we'll, you know, the leadership of that committee is going to change next year, one way or the other, and my hope is that uh, we'll be able to see a more collaborative approach that actually allows us to build these frameworks around data. Uh, and, and, you know, get our policymakers uh, more engaged because I think the history has been that they, they generally don't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole, right? Either because they're afraid of it, they don't understand it, or because they've been told that, you know, if they, they touch innovation, it's going to drop dead, you know, like a, like a delicate fawn in the woods. It's really more like a cockroach, right? Innovation isn't going anywhere. Uh, and we, you know, but we can build the frameworks around it, right? So that, uh, 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 you know, we are actually getting technology in line with our values, and, and we can do that for protecting data. That's a really great question. I love it so much. Um, so 
one of the projects I'm working on is about youth economic development and thinking just as you said, how do we give our young people skills that will prepare them for the future of work? So all very exciting. Um, for me personally, there's a designer that created a continuum around um, user-centered design versus co-creation. Um, so she has a little spectrum. On one side is when we ask communities what they want and then they inform the work. And in the middle is co-creation. So user-centered design, co-creation. And then she has another one that's user-created design. So actually having communities be designers in their own lives. So um, since I'm speaking in my role as government, that would be the future I would want where we can find a way where we leverage everybody, the, the watchdogs, the technology companies, the innovators, um, to work together to create the future we want. So. Oh, that's a great answer. I mean, I, I, you know, I would, I would build on that to say, you know, you, you, you talk about skilling. You know, I think some of the work that we do is, uh, you know, to, to use a different term, capacity building, right? So how do we build the capacity of impacted communities to engage with processes that, that uh, result in technologies that, that currently are often sort of, you know, airdropped onto them with sometimes not congruent results, right? Um, and I, so... Thinking, you know, as, 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 you know, someone that thinks around, around policy frameworks a lot, I think it does, uh, you know, the, the foundation is sort of meaningful data privacy, and I hope we can, you know, do something uh, uh, that moves the ball forward in Washington uh, next session. Uh, I also think, you know, there are, you know, step, step two is also uh, a transparency frameworks, right? So in the context of AI, uh, one of the biggest parts of the problem is we have no way of knowing, right, in what public decisions AI is actually being used, right? You're, I mean, it's been likened by some commentators to this massive human experiment where, right, uh, if I were a university researcher that were, was using a tool that impacted people's health, right, all kinds of ethical considerations would apply. But because I'm an HMO using an algorithm to determine how much people pay for healthcare or what kind of healthcare they get, that, that is removed from the realm of ethics entirely, right? And it shouldn't be. Uh, so, you know, creating transparency frameworks, and a good example is in Washington State this session, uh, we had what I think was the first of its kind bill in the country. <clears throat> you know, we called it the Tech Fairness Bill that would, uh, for public uh, decision-making where automated decision systems or ADS, right, this form of AI that makes automated decisions that replace human discretion, uh, the public would actually have to know about that. There would be uh, essentially a public comment period that would be modeled on the Seattle Surveillance Ordinance with agencies actually having to do the homework about what's the evidence about this tool, how does it work, what data sets does it include, how biased are those data sets, right, et cetera, et cetera. To, to get out there what we know about the, the tool so that we can anticipate problems before the tool is thrown out there. And it would have to be uh, approved by the chief, the chief privacy officer after this public comment period. So that, that kind of thing would be a good first step. And then there's actual substantive frameworks around particular uses of technology. And, and you know, in particular, I'm concerned about a mechanism to, to say, sometimes we just don't want to use a technology in a given way. One example I'll give you on that is uh, affect recognition in face surveillance tools, right? So there are products on the market right now that purport to analyze your face print and determine whether you have a propensity to be a terrorist. Or, or even walking a step back from that, whether you're just happy or angry, right, at a particular time. And studies, you know, done on these tools have shown that you know, two basketball players, they're both smiling. Uh, the algorithm thinks that the, the black basketball player is angry and that the white one is happy or angrier and happier, right? Imagine that tool incorporated into a police body camera that then tells the officer, hey, look, you know, this person is angry or this person is dangerous and that officer making a life or death decision based on that. Uh, this harkens back to this, uh, you know, this, this long science of physiognomy right, and race that has long since been discredited scientifically, but again, because it's data science, we're bringing it back. Uh, and I think as a society, we should have a mechanism to say no. Look, right, the only way that tool can be used is likely going to exacerbate racism and structural inequity in our society. Let's not do it. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I think our policymakers are starting to move in that direction and, and get more brave about saying, wait a minute, 
you know, tech's not going to police itself. We need to, to also step in and put some rules of the road in place. So that's what I hope happens. God, that's hard to follow up. Um, sort of to your point about skilling and also the other side of this coin, I think we're really focused on data literacy and, and uh, data culture. I mean, I think right now analytics are really the providence of a small set of people inside any sort of organization. Um, and it's sort of treated as an elite skill and it absolutely should not be. Um, I think we all have a need uh, and ability to think about the analytics in our day-to-day -day lives, personal life, career, um, and we need to be doing a much better job of getting people not just in the education system but who are mid-career, late career, at a point where they can understand how data is being used to interpret their lives. And this really gets to your point about people having access to uh, and the ability to understand the data that regulators are being used, public officials are, being, are using um, to make decisions about you know, how to act in any particular given situation. So it's not just a matter of putting the regulation in place, but having people have that sort of data literacy to be able to, to be an equal partner in that process. And so we've been spending a bunch of time working uh, you know, in particular with the Seattle colleges here, uh, trying to figure out, okay, how can we not just have analytics courses, but look, let's look at the broad swath. Math, sciences, humanities, you know, where is the analytical backbone here and where can we up the ability for people to learn through their subject matter, subject matter expertise and, and be more participatory in, in, in an increasingly uh, data-driven world. I'm gonna comment too, just because I can't resist. So um, I, I think it will, two things. One, and, and uh, Steve and I are both attending this event later tonight. There, there is a, a group here um, that's now gone nationwide, came out of the Washington Technology Industry Association called Apprenti, and it's challenging the assumptions that you, you know, have to go get a four-year degree in computer science and you have to start out like liking math and probably you have to be a white male or an Indian male uh, in order to be successful in the technology world. And it's allowing people who just have some aptitude as demonstrated from a four-hour test um, to think logically, to be able to, to uh, um, really think about language because computer science is just another language as is data. And it's allowing them to really transform their lives often later in life, you know, 35, 40, whatever, uh, as uh, in this case, women of color, veterans and underrepresented minorities in less than a year um, go from uh, unemployed or a service job um, making $25,000 a year to being able to make 75,000 and up in the tech world. Um, and this is the kind of program that I think, um, you know, we need to see more of to allow more people to have access to, the, to, this, um, to this new economy. And the other thing I would say, um, just to flip uh, Shankar's thinking a little bit, is I totally agree, we do not want bias in our system, but having humans doing something right now has a tremendous amount of bias, right? So I think of like spell check, right? I, I am a terrible speller, and I'm really grateful for spell check because it's a lot better at spelling than I am if there was a technology that allowed our police officers to make better decisions about who is threatening and who isn't threatening than what is built into their already admittedly, like all of us, biased brains, that would be awesome. Now we need to have the right data set for that and we ha need to have the right people designing uh, that technology. He needs the mic. But it isn't a foregone conclusion that humans are gonna be better than human designed machines. Well, just a, a brief, a brief rejoinder on that. You know, I, I mean, part of the challenge with systemic bias in AI tools is that it's systemic, right? It reflect what it reflects is uh, structural inequity, right? And we're sort of building this this plane as we're flying it. So we're also learning to talk about what structural inequity is. You know, I think the the challenge, of course, is say, right, decision making in judicial systems. We. Those of us who are lawyers have always, you know, we all have our nightmare story of the judge, right, who's a terrible judge, horribly biased, hates our client, right? And we go up in front of them and we're like, oh, that's a, ter you know, that judge was really, really terrible. But of course, we also have our good judges, right? The judges that actually are listening to us and like our clients, right? 
Uh, the point is that human bias tends to be multidirectional, right? And when you replace it with an algorithm, you're replacing all of those judges with a single set of assumptions that rests on the bias that is demonstrated in our criminal justice system. And I think, you know, in, in this instance, uh, you know, I've been hearing for a, for a long time that the, that the solution, right, to biased AI is just better data sets. Find a clean data set, we'll fix it. The problem is, in a structurally inequitable society, all of our data appears to be infected, sometimes fatally, by, that, by those biases. And it's extremely difficult to fix them. You know, I get, re I get paid to read too many papers. I've got piles of academic papers on bias this high on my desk. And I, I can tell you the one takeaway is, it's extremely hard to fix, even if you are trying to fix the bias, right? So, uh, and then the other question, of course, is, right, better decisions by officers, better for whom, right? How does it differentially impact communities? And I think those questions of power, right, to, to leave off where we started it, are, you know, really have to be applied to every application, not only at, at the stage of formulating the question, but what inputs go in, who gets to decide, right, how the tool is designed, and again, really, who wins and loses, right? Because different calibrations of a tool actually produce different sets of winners and losers. Let's make those things explicit and then have a conversation about whether we even can build a tool that can improve on admittedly biased human decision making. I like the conversation part for sure. Um, we've been spending a lot of time on this one lately, and it's really tricky um, because there is, uh, quite honestly, there's nothing that one company or one non nonprofit or even one regional government can do. It needs to be a, a complete collaborative effort. Um, right now, we see, at least from my desk, a lot of the work that is going into using data and technology, quite honestly, isn't around advocacy for encouraging those larger bodies to do more. Um, there, you know, it's a huge number of, of ways we could think about using technology, whether it's sort of optimizing to minimize the impact of carbon. Are we trying to, are we focused on reduction? Are we focused on adaptability? Are we focused on some segment of a solution? Um, there's no easy answer. And I think, actually, there is an easy answer. We have to do all of it, um, or we're, it's gonna get real ugly real fast. Um, but I, I sort of challenge everybody in this room to just think beyond just trying to influence somebody else to make a certain decision because what we have found is really just, the data's all been out there for decades. Um, it's not a question of being right. It's not a question of showing competency, um, but it really is a matter of actually being able to, uh, ha to be able to implement something that substantively makes a difference. That is a great note to end on, unfortunately. Uh, this has been a terrific panel. You are all just amazing, and this audience is amazing, too. So thank you all so much for being here, and I look forward to this kind of dialogue continuing uh, in the years to come.